Hi, welcome to another Carolyn Glick show. I'm really pleased and honored today to have my uh, old friend and esteemed colleague, uh, Victor Davis Hansen, uh, here as my guest today. Uh, Victor, I consider him uh, perhaps the greatest expert on American affairs um, and the American soul, really. And so for me, it's, it's, uh, it's time, really, when all of us are thinking about where America stands vis-a-vis uh, -vis Israel, where America stands vis-a-vis -vis itself as it looks at Israel at war and, and under uh, threat of genocide, slaughter, and, and annihilation at the hands of Iran and its uh, tentacles, Hamas, Hezbollah, its proxies in Syria and Iraq, and so on and so forth, and the Houthis in Yemen. So I I, I was very pleased when uh, Victor said yes to my my request to join me on the show today. So first of all, thank you and uh, welcome, Victor, to the Carolyn Glick Show. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's it's uh, it's really my honor. Anyway, um, I, I wanted to just start with a general question. I saw an interview that you gave uh, to the estimable uh, John Anderson on his podcast uh, shortly after uh, Hamas enacted its slaughter, I think about four days in. Um, and, and you were fairly optimistic about what was happening uh, with the Biden administration vis-a-vis -vis its response to uh, the slaughter of October 7th in, in southern Israel uh, at the hands of Hamas. And um wondering um, whether you still feel optimistic or what's the basis for your optimism that the Biden administration has abandoned the hostile posture that, he's, that it's held since it entered office in January of 2021 and, and it's moving to a different position. Well, I might qualify that. I don't think I said I was confident in the Biden administration. I was confident in the American people to either support Biden when he occasionally supported Israel or when he more frequently equivocated or opposed it, they would ignore it. And I think I was talking about public opinion. And Joe Biden, I feel, has been woefully unsupportive of Israel. And he says... There, there are indications that he does not, he either does not like Israel or he doesn't know what he's doing and he's influenced by people who don't. And I can just give you three random okay, examples. Okay, wait, so let me just, let me interrupt you for just one second. Can we, can we just, can we, if, if that's the case and I misunderstood, and can you explain to me uh, first about the American response, American view, and second about the Biden administration and, and what it's doing? Just to separate well, 65%, 65% in most polls support Israel. And that that is even articulated in, do you support Israel replying to Hamas? And that's going, that has not wavered even with the bombing and the UN and the EU, all of the propaganda. It's steady. And yes, there's a lot of attention on the campuses and the university presidents, but that's true everywhere. So the American people are with Israel, and Joe Biden knows that, and that's why he says things that seem supportive of Israel at times, and so does Blinken. I don't think they are. They only put their hand in the, the wind and feel where the next poll is going, or that they are ideologically for, um, I don't want to say for the killing in Hamas, that would be libelous, but I think they're indifferent to the effect it has on Israel. And I say that without rhetorical exaggeration. So if you have Corinne Jean-Pierre, the spokeswoman, and someone ask her, as they did the other day, are you worried about the anti-Semitism? And Jews make up half of all reported FBI hate crimes. 2% of the population, 50%. Muslims are about 15 down as far as the categories of a of people who are victims. And she says, well, yeah, yeah, but Islamophobia, and there is no documented widespread attacks on Muslims. In fact, Muslims are in the streets of New York and Washington, our campus, openly siding with these murderers and butchers. And then secondly, Anthony Blinken, just to, I'm just giving anecdotes that give you a little window into their soul. When the false story came out about the hospitals. Almost his first reaction was that he urged Middle East American embassies to fly their flags at half-mast. And then when Joe Biden, this was very, 
I, I was very shocked when Joe Biden was asked about the false narrative. He said, well, the old saying goes, you got to shoot straight. If you, if you just take a second to analyze that, what he was basically saying, if Islamic Jihad had a shot straight and killed Jewish citizens in Tel Aviv, then I wouldn't have been snubbed at all these camp at these capitals, and there wouldn't have been this all this problem, and I wouldn't have had to give an extra hundred million to to uh, Hamas. And so you can see, with that type of mentality, they find Israel an irritant. They they find it an irritant, and but they're not politically able to stop giving weapons to Israel or to say you can't do this. They try to urge, they try to cajole, but they have a problem, and that problem to return is public opinion. 65% of the American people support what Israel is doing right at this second. The problem is, of course, that the Israeli government is in a bind because we need American military equipment. You know, There are certain things that we need to fight that are made in America, and they limit the they limit the amount that they give us at any particular part of time and the emergency uh, the emergency arsenal that is regularly based in Israel the American emergency uh, arsenal was emptied uh, in January and transferred lock stock and barrel to Ukraine so we we need the bombs made in America for our planes we need the Iron Dome missiles of course which I don't think there would be a problem replenishing. But they're also only made in America. We need um, we need shells for our for our tanks and for our and for our artillery in particular, and they're made in America largely. And so, um, what we've seen uh, really since the outset is that Israel can't criticize the Biden administration's uh, policies because we need them. And so. Israel, in fact, is 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 constantly thanking the Biden administration for its support. So it seems to most people that the Biden administration is being very helpful. But I just read this uh, Axios piece this that came out today that said, um, but President Biden, despite full-throated support for Israel and its right to strike Hamas, has methodically and meticulously delayed the expected invasion of Gaza, U.S. officials tell us. Biden dangled high-level visits, including his own military support and public backing, to buy time in Gaza. He also made plain that America doesn't want Israel to act impulsively or without considering U.S. concern. And we know he demanded, and he said he demanded, he admitted it, no siege of Gaza. They're allowing resupply of Hamas under the under the headline uh, humanitarian assistance when Hamas controls everything that goes into Gaza and they take whatever they want, including all the fuel that came in earlier. They just took it. Um, and that's that's war material, not to mention the trucks themselves are war material. And, um, you know, he said uh, he said he, they keep, you know, hectoring us about international law, international law. They they prohibited us from uh, preemptively striking Hezbollah's missiles. So they gave Hezbollah a green light to slowly escalate their attacks against Israel and barred Israel from taking any action that would end those strikes or limit the 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 damage that Hezbollah can exert on Israel uh, when and if uh, the war lights up completely. So they're they're making all of these moves that limit Israel's Israel's operations and um, and Israel for its part can't object because we need the US we need the US arms. And so we've gotten into the situation where the 65 percent of Americans, who no doubt support Israel, don't really understand what's happening. Oh, I think they do. And I think they ha they share their sh your same frustration. Because I've ha I, I spoke to 400 people last night in Las Vegas, or 300, and everybody had an on this matter that you're talking about, and they share your frustration. And, and how's that articulated in this country? The majority of us support Israel. And the Biden administration is forced by that public opinion to get, to do something, not what it should do. And we want to criticize it. But if we criticize it and we damn Joe Biden, then we drive him closer into the hands of the extremists who control the Democratic Party. So we're put into an impossible situation. 
by saying, well, yes, Biden did give some weapons, and yes, Biden did this, even though we know he's not a friend of Israel. But we don't want to criticize and attack them to the degree that we we get this whole, because they have the power. The conservative Republican movement has one half of one third of government, and we know that. And so we know what they're doing. The only thing that's ironic about all of this, that there are members of the Democratic Party who privately are very upset, and they balance the left wing, and that they and the conservative pressure and public opinion so far has given some support from this administration only because they are afraid of the American people and the next election, and only because we've, Israel's got some very strong defenders in the media, the Senate, etc., as well as public opinion. But I think everybody in the United States agrees with you, the majority. They, they agree with you that this administration has been willfully blind or deliberately lacking and inadequate of what it should have been doing. And yet the more we criticize them, the more they get defensive and say, well, if we're going to lose all those people, we might as well just appeal to our base. And so it's an impossible situation for Israel, and it's an impossible situation for us. But that being said, the fact is most people are with the Israelis in the United States. That's a clear... Uh, I live in an area that's 95% Mexican-American. I'm told by the left-wing media that the DEI industry is all for Israel. I mean, for Hamas. Yet every Mexican-American person I talk to, working class, are for adamantly pro-Israel. It, the, the divide in America is not by race or party or ideology as much as it is by class. The, the wealthier, the more elite, the more bicoastal, and the more degree, the more anti-Israel. The greatest opposition in, in Israel, we know that, are PhDs at university. And they're very influential. And so it's very frustrating because they're anti-empirical. You can't argue with them. You can't. If, they, if you say, I had a, a PhD the other day at Stanford tell me that Israel was an apartheid state. And I said, have you ever gone to Israel and seen the um, civic privileges accorded to Arabs and Arab Muslims in particular? Or do you really believe people would rather go back to Gaza from Israel? And of course, they have no answer. But for them, it's just something you say on a campus. It's like a demnomy insurance, or you just say it, and then all good things happen to you. If you say the opposite, the truth, then you get static, and most people have no ideology. They just want to be in with the majority. And that on our campuses, that's the majority. And let's hope that when a Republican administration comes in, they look at taxing endowment income, getting this, the government out of student loans, doing... There's a lot of things you could do to shake up these universities and open them up because they play a very pernicious role. Well, I agree. And, and that wasn't going to be my next question, but if you've already raised it... Um, you know, uh, when I was growing up in the United States in the 1970s and the 1980s, there was a profound sense of relief among American Jews, the sense that the American people, very different from Europe, um, were not um, were not anti-Semitic from a sociological perspective. That, yes, there was anti-Semitism in, in the United States, just as there is everywhere, but that it wasn't a salient... Um, it wasn't a salient component of political life, that it wasn't a good way. It wasn't a group. I mean, anti-Semitism in Europe was a mobilizing force in politics, populism, um, uh, nativism, nationalism. A lot of these concepts, and you hear the recoiling of American Jews from, from the term nationalism, it's because in Europe, the nationalist movements such as they were uh, used anti-Semitism as a tool for political motivation. I mean, politi uh, Professor Ruth Rice Weiss has written about this pretty prodigiously over the years. And um, 
And there was a sense in the past that it was not a mobilizing force, or, or at least since the 1930s and, and Charles Lindbergh and Father Coughlin, it was not a mobilizing force of American politics. But today it is. On the left, it's very much a mobilizing force. And on the far right, uh, so far in the far right, it, it's a marginal force still, but it, it, it is also becoming a much more salient organizing principle for politics. And uh, but it, it's very, very blatant on the on the left. And and like you said, in universities, but it's also you see it at the Democratic National Convention. I mean, how it, how profound do you think that the shift, the embrace, the prominence of Jew hatred on campuses has manifested in this kind of statements that you mentioned? How, how much has that really filtered into into partisan politics? In America, how how big a threat is that to American Jewish life, to American society? Well, it's a it's a deep threat because it's on the campuses, and they are the people who educate. They educate college students, and they train the School of Education credentialed teachers that teach K through twelve. And what's happened in the United States is that we have fifty million people who were not born in the United States residents. And citizenship and residency is so blurred that people can vote even if they're not citizens sometimes. In California, 27% of the resident population did not live here. So we have an enormous group of unassimilated aliens. We had 8 million people come in illegal through a completely disastrous open border by intention of the Democratic Party. And that group now composes... Uh, I would call it the DEI group, 30% of the population. And what they did was absolutely brilliant. What the Palestinian refugees, the so-called refugees, first and second generation Hamas supporters, they glued a fascistic cause onto the DEI and this Marxist binary of oppressors, oppressed, victimizers, victimized. So they said to blacks, Latinos, gays, trans, we are victimized, just like you. We're, we're colonial subjects. And because of the ignorance of, our, of these groups and their lack of education in the universities, they bought into that. And that meant that they had complete sanctuary. They had, they had complete exemption from criticism because if you start to attack them now, they ally themselves with the DEI um, uh, shield. So, for example, if BLM has a glider poster glorifying somebody shooting Jews from the air, or Professor Kendi says this, or we have a La Raza group says that, then when you criticize them, then you are criticizing people of color or victims of American oppression. And yet, when you try to, to explain to them that Hamas represents, really it's an incarnation of National Socialist Society. And the way that they kill Jews is no different than what happened in Ukraine and Lithuania in 1944 following the SS. There were even, you, you, I've had this conversation, even civilians, as you know, followed the, the gunmen and were happy to do the gunmen's work. And you try to tell people that and they say you're racist. And so that is the obstacle right now that Israel comes off, and I'll be blunt with you, in this paradigm that is perpetuated on the campus, Israel is wealthy, Israel is Western, Israel is white, and therefore the Palestinians are non-white, and they're victims, and they're poor, and you can't, they don't want to talk about anything else, and they're ignorant. And I, I don't mean that just loosely. When you see a map on MSNBC the other day and Tel Aviv is up on the Golan Heights and Israel's cities are located inside the West Bank and they don't know where any cities are and they're lecturing us, the American people, it's, for, it's, it, it's really disturbing. And so it's just sort of a religion now of colonialism, racism, imperialism, and somehow over the last 30 years, the radical Palestinians and all Palestinians have put, as Islam in, in general, have put themselves in that camp. Now, once they do that, Carolyn, there is a backlash. And the backlash is people say, if you're going to be tribal, 
and you're going to make your identity essential rather than incidental to you who you are, and you're going to ally with BLM, then there's going to be a price for it. And there also there's a lot of people very very angry at the entire um, pro Hamas movement, and I know they get the intention, but I can tell you. And it's not just the Jewish community. There are people who said, I've had it with these people. I've had it with them. And we're, and when you see the governor of Florida say very bravely, I'm going to disband any Palestinian group who openly supports Hamas because it's a recognized terrorist organization and it's against the law. That's pretty radical for one of the largest states in the United States. And there's going to be others that do that. And so they think they're very smart right now, aligned with what they think is the woke DEI movement, but they're aligned with it at a time when people are sick of the woke movement. I think that's revealed in the polls too. And I think if Israel tomorrow feels, and I hope they do, that they have to settle, even though it's going to be bloody, they have to settle with Hamas. They have no choice. Then I think there's going to be overwhelming American support and this administration will oppose it, but they'll be driven by that support. And if you try, the irony in America is that the majority knows that if Israel does not react to Hamas, then Hezbollah and Iran will intervene on the principle that what will it take for them to react and destroy Hamas if they don't do it after these hundreds of people are butchered? And so most people understand that. And that it, it, if they do respond, then Hamas, and they do eliminate Hamas, then Hezbollah and Iran will say, I do not want that to happen to me, and it will happen to me, and they won't. And that's kind of a counterintuitive argument that I think most people, believe it or not, accept in the, in the United States. And we surely did it after 9-11, and no one told us to be proportionate. And no one told us to end the cycle of violence. All of that stuff, end, of the, end the cycle of violence, be that's all coming out of the State Department, this administration, and the campuses. But you don't hear it in the rest of the country. The question is how much power the rest of the country has. Because, I it mean, does. That's a the very American good people opposed uh, the, the, the way that the United States... Uh, uh, ran away from Afghanistan and left ninety billion or eighty billion dollars uh, worth of advanced weaponry in the hands of the Taliban. People were aghast when they saw the massacre of U.S. forces outside of the out of outside of the airport and the abandonment of U.S. citizens and all the rest of it. And and nobody supported that. But you know, Biden shrugged his shoulders, said, "Oh, we did great. It was perfect." Uh, Blinken said the same thing. They just lied and they went on and, and nothing happened to them. The, you know, there nobody was censured. Nobody was ousted from office. Nothing happened. And there are so many other examples of that over the past three years. And uh, I don't know. I mean, it, it, you're right. So why am I asking this? And and so if you could answer both questions at once. I'm asking this because I, I'm trying to put myself for a second in Netanyahu's shoes. And what he's seeing is a... Republican Congress that can elect a speaker. You're you're looking at um, you're looking at a hobbled uh, former president uh, who's very likely to win the primary, and he's saying all kinds of things like attacking Netanyahu first and foremost, and saying Hezbollah is smart, whatever that means, and then that has to be uh, that has to be translated into what he meant, which I don't think was that he supports Hezbollah. I think the opposite, but the the point is is that where's where's the, what can Israel rely on? He's being crushed by pressure from Biden. That of course is being backed up by this turnstile of European leaders who come in, say that they just like Biden say that they're in solidarity with us, and then tell us, uh, you better not invade Gaza, you better not win, you better let in resupply to Hamas, and we're going to call humanitarian assistance. We get cursed by the UN Secretary General um, and accused of murder when he spends, you know, five seconds saying, oh, it's terrible what Hamas did without describing it. And, you know, I mean, I, I'm i wondering how do we empower Netanyahu? Because it seems to me that in order to win, he has to stand up to Biden because the, 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 the things that Biden is demanding from Israel 
are all things that will prevent us from winning. How, how do you how do you judge the importance of if Amer- if Israel comes in, go, we we enter into Gaza, we invade, we get a backlash, and the American people, you know, are polled and eighty percent support, not sixty five. We support Israel fighting to victory. Why would why would that matter? Well, it it won't matter unless the opposition, as you say, is united. But this is not confined to the United States. There is a Western disease of affluence and leisure that is postmodern in nature, and people are not eager to it. I have talked to people in the last two years I was in Israel, and they have told me, people in the government, people, intellectuals, that there was a new dawn in Israel that the Abram Accords were going to work. The Iran deal was off the table. Israel was never more powerful. Thousands of guest workers were coming into Hamas. They were getting X amount of dollars, and each dollar supported four people back in Gaza. And there was a sense among many Israelis that there was no, you didn't have to worry about a margin of error. You had a million people in the street. And when we watched that, we said, oh my gosh, they are mirror imaging this Western disease that we have, and we've never seen that before. But it's a laxity and a magnanimity that's going to be reciprocated by their existential enemies as weakness, and it's not going to be repaid in kind by magnanimity. And we knew that, and we knew it because it's us. But we always thought you, on as a right on the edge of the spear, would never do that because to do that was almost collective suicide. And that was worrying us. So we understand that. And what we look at here is people, if you look at the polls right now, Joe Biden is polling anywhere from 38 to 39%. The border, crime, energy, what you talked about uh, in Afghanistan, the Chinese balloon, everything is unpopular. And so the Hamas supporters have allied themselves with that agenda. They're on the woke agenda. They're on the open border. They're on uh, the Afghanistan pullout. They, that's what they've cho- chosen to do, and there's no pop- popular support for it. In a normal political landscape, it would be suicidal for them. But we have a problem on the conservative side because w- looming is Donald Trump, as you articulated. He's done a lot of good things for Israel. But as you say, he's facing four separate indictments. It's unfair. It's tragic. It's horrific what they're doing to him. But they're doing it to him. And they plan to put him in jail and have a gag order. And all of the Republican opposition to this madness is divided itself. They can't can't pick a speaker. And they say this. Well, I know that he's... He's going to be inert, but I, but he's he did such a good job, I have to be loyal. And then the other side says, yes, he did a good job, but he's not going to be a viable candidate. And they're cannibalizing each other. And meanwhile, a government with 38% support with not one winning issue, and this includes their pro or anti-Israel position, is exercising policy. But I don't think that's sustainable. Once we get a candidate and we can unite behind them, and people, as we'll get a, I think we will get a speaker in the next week or two. I think you'll see people reflect politically the polls that's there. This is the greatest opportunity in my lifetime for a conservative traditionalist party to take the House, the Senate, and the presidency. If that should happen, you would see a radical difference. If U.S. policy that had power right now reflected public opinion, Israel would have been going into Gaza whenever it wanted. It probably would have already gone in. And we would be vying with each other to give it the tools it needs. But the problem is we have a party that came in through a very variety of bizarre circumstances, is in power with no public support. And Hamas is riding high and radical Palestinians are riding high because they think they have the levers of government. And they do, but they don't have public opinion and they're not going to retain those levers of government. And even when they have those levers of government, they still can't get around the fact 
that Biden and Blinken and Sullivan are forced to at least give Israel enough to survive. I was surprised we gave them what we did. And uh, it's our job here in the United States to each person according to our station to articulate the history of Israel, what it needs to survive, but especially the idea that if Israel does not have a deterrent, it's going to be destroyed by these people. They want to destroy. It's not about land. It's not about anything. They want to destroy the Jewish state. And the only way that it can survive and thrive is to destroy the people who are going to try to destroy them. And once you try to, that's a very hard message for Americans to understand. And yet they, I, I'm, I'm, the reason I'm confident in this, so many people understand it. And again, just to finish, Joe Biden is being led by events. He did not want to put two carrier groups out there in the eastern Mediterranean. They're there. And if Hezbollah or Iran shoots anything at them, there's going to be a logic that's independent of what Joe Biden and Anthony Blinken want. They will be forced to respond. And I still believe that Iran, riding high with all this money we gave them, the newfound ally of China and Russia, bragging about what Hamas did, they are in the most perilous position they've ever been in. Because there is going to be, if they try to intervene directly or via Hezbollah, there's no restraints put upon Israel, and there's no restraints if they attack that carrier group. So for the first time in my life, I'm watching Israel be... Maybe. Um, Let me just... Yeah, go ahead. Maybe, because they're getting it. They're getting attacked. Right. I mean, they're getting attacked by the Houthis. They're getting attacked by Iranian proxies and they're not responding. So, well, I mean, you're they right. Did there is a dynamic. You have they're, a carrier. Shoot, we're getting to an accord. They did shoot down missiles that were not aimed at them, American naval ship. But they're in a well, position where they're. Whether... And now there are reports that there were actually wounded U.S. forces yes. that they hid. Yeah. Yes. They lied about and, it. They, they didn't mention yes. it, and it only came out you but know, several days later. The Biden administration is doing all of the... When you look at our S Secretary of Defense, and he's trying to explain all the attacks that have happened, 93 attacks by Iran. Only three have been... Four have been retaliated. He doesn't... He can't even do it. So what I'm saying is this is... They put themselves in an unsustainable position. They thought they were going to put all of these assets there tell the world we helped Israel without helping Israel. But what they didn't understand is they put their credibility and they put the American people's credibility. And if those assets are attacked or if Iran continues to do that, the events will lead Joe Biden. He will not be able to, to affect those events. I've seen it happen before. So you believe that just because they're there and their their position is indefensible, it doesn't make any sense or it's incoherent or whatnot, that they're going to be forced by the dynamic to actually do something. Yes, I think they'll have to. I think it was a very risky move for a president of this caliber to put ten to 20,000 armed servicemen in that position with 30 or $40 billion of assets, given what happened in Afghanistan, Chinese balloon caught off guard in Ukraine. But they're there now. And there is there is no way in the world if they are attacked, they're go not going to be. And I don't think it's sustainable for Iran to keep attacking U.S. assets in Syria or Iraq either. And so they're, they are being driven by events, and they don't understand it yet. And Iran does understand it. Iran never has been more bellicose in its rhetoric and more afraid to confront directly I mean, after all, they have the little Satan and the great Satan right there, and it's a so supposed a war that they caused. And you say to them, well, you wanted the war, you have it. Here's your two greatest enemies in the world. Go to it. But they don't go to it. They use these sporadic attacks, daily attacks, but they know something. And I think what they know is the American people. I mean, Carolyn, if you look around the world, do they really think Russia, who's tied down in in Ukraine and doesn't has its own losing problems going to intervene for Iran? Do they think China that wants free oil with six ships is going to help them? Do they think the EU, who is terrified 
of Iran is going to help them. And you know better than I do in that part of the world that the more loudly these regimes attack Israel privately, they call your leaders and say, would you deal with Iran or Hezbollah or Hamas? So there is no restraining influence on anybody who wants to retaliate with Iran other than the fact that no one wants a theater destructive war. But they have put themselves in a situation by their provocations and their bellicosity and what Hamas did to people in Israel that they're very vulnerable right now. And I think they're going to be very, very careful. And if they're not careful, the American public opinion and people in the military are going to force Joe Biden to react. I don't want to attack my own government because they're, you know, I'm, I'm an American, but we are in a situation where we have the least effective government for what is going on now in my lifetime. I'm 70 years old. I've never seen anything. Even Jimmy Carter had something called the Carter Doctrine that followed his appeasement. So this is a multifaceted failure on our part. And yet, I think the institutions and public opinion are such that people will go to the aid of Israel. And I think that is in spite of what our government wants to do. I don't think Blinken and Sullivan and Biden want to do that. I don't think the Obamas, who are, I think, running a lot of it, I don't think Bernie Sanders, the squad, Elizabeth Warren, they're all anti-Israeli. And they are angry that they have not convinced the public yet. And they won't. And so I think people understand what Israel's doing. I think Israel's been, for all the criticism they have of Israel, most people believe if you listen to Hamas, it's a lie. If you listen to the idea for Israeli sportsmen, it's a truth. And that's just a fact. And when so people, so I just wanna, uh, I just wanna, I just wanna give you a scenario. Uh, in 1983, right, uh, coming up in the 40th anniversary this month, I think it might even be today or tomorrow. Um, it's uh, the Marine barracks were bombed in Beirut, and that was a couple of months after the uh, the U.S. embassy bombing in Beirut. And 241 Marines were killed. And, and and the Beirut story was really interesting because it's very similar to what's playing out today, which is that the Americans were anti-Israel. I mean, the Reagan policy regarding Israel and Lebanon was very hostile. They they thought that we were the problem. They protected a PLO. They uh, compelled Israel to allow Arafat and his men to escape when they were besieged in Beirut. Which wasn't a terrible thing, but that that was the American policy. They they saved the PLO from annihilation in Beirut, and then um, they forced Israel to leave Beirut. And their idea was that Israel was the occupier; that we were the mess. We we were the reason that there was a mess. And they came in. They replaced us with U.S. peacekeepers, and they found. I, I read this incredible memoir by one of the Marines who was in the barracks, and he was telling what happened in Beirut on the ground, and he explained from the position of a Marine that they came in, they took Israel's positions, and the Lebanese treated the Americans who were hostile to Israel um, or, per, or per, per trying to advance a policy that was not, not supportive of Israel at all, and they treated them as Israel. The, the Falange uh, uh, Christian militias did, the Christians themselves did, the Shiites did, the Sunnis did, so the Sunnis with, with uh, Syria, the Shiites with Iran, um, and and they and the United States, the great Satan in their eyes, but not in America's eyes, were treated exactly as the Israelis were. We got a suicide bombing at our paratroopers um, a command post in uh, in Sidon, and and Americans got it in Beirut. And Reagan responded to that not by fighting back, but by leaving. And why wouldn't Biden just respond the same way to some catastrophic attack on an American asset in the Middle East and just say, we're picking up our marbles and going wrong and we're and we're going to continue this policy. And then he had Iran Contra. And now you have already from the very outset, America uh, paying ransom to Hamas with uh, humanitarian assistance, which is resupply that's being mediated by Qatar, which is uh, uh, Hamas, the, the epicenter of the Muslim Brotherhood. So 
I, I see a possibility of a different scenario playing out than the one that you than the one that you laid out, which seems rational, but there's this prison. Yeah, I, I, there's one. I would take issue in one aspect. It's a peculiar. It's a peculiarity of American politics that when you have a conservative president in and he is not pro-Israel, it's disastrous because people feel they have to be loyal to the Republican Party and the Republican conservative movement in the last 40 years is the source of support for Israel. When you have a Democratic president that does that, then you have opposition to him. But when you have a presidency, and I'm I have Ronald Reagan did a number of things, but when you have James Baker and Casper Weinberger telling Ronald Reagan every day that you've got you should never put them there, you've got to go there, and you have a lone voice, George Schultz says, "Well, let's just at least." And he was not himself a big pro-Israeli, but he at least said we need to take yeah, battleships and, and send it. But my point is. The people who support Israel are on the conservative side, whether we like to say that or not, and now their leader is not supporting Israel. So that is, well, do we attack our own person or do we try to influence him privately? But that has not happened in 35 years because George W. Bush was a supporter of Israel. I know that the, he didn't do what he all should have, but Donald Trump was a very strong supporter of Israel. But now we have a Democratic president that will be under enormous pressure by the majority of the people. And there won't be anybody who says, oh, Victor, I'm the Senate um, minority leader. And by the way, I read a call and please don't attack Joe Biden. He's one of us. And, I, and I'm not saying that the support is not genuine, but the political reality is that Joe Biden has no support from it's not like Ukraine where you have Republicans supporting him and opposing him. It's a hundred percent pro-Israel on the Republican side, and he's got an increasingly—I don't know what the word is—but left-wing Democrats that are waking up and saying, "My God, I didn't real not realize about this Frankensteinian monster we created on this anti-Semitic, anti-Israel left," and there's even. Uh, some dissension in the Democratic Party. So I think he's going to be under so much more pressure. The other thing is very quickly, Ronald Reagan was a very popular president. Joe Biden is a very unpopular president. Reagan had public opinion. So we have a very unpopular, weak, weak president with divisions on Israel within his own party and a completely united opposition who has majority public opinion support, at least in the polls. And that, I think, puts a lot more pressure on Joe Biden than Ronald Reagan. I have no confidence in Joe Biden as a leader. I'm just saying that I think the events that he put himself unknowingly in, I don't even think he knew what he was doing. I don't think he put those carriers to help Israel. I don't think he did it to help us. I think somebody suggested that he did, and he did it. And now he's put himself in a position that he's going to be led by events. That's all. Uh, I, I think I think you're right. I also see a cognitive dissonance in his in his policies, and I and and it's possible. Sometimes I think it's completely cynical, and all of his, you know, Hava Nagila statements of solidarity and support for Israel are for are for public opinion. And sometimes I think that they're genuine, but when and no matter either way, they're counterbalanced by this hostility bubbling up. In every statement, you know, it's always on the one hand and on the other hand, you know, starting at the very beginning, at the outset, his initial remarks, uh, I think the day of the slaughter, the day after the slaughter, and where he was saying international law, like, what, you know, what, you know, yeah, so, and and the point is, is that there, it's the hectoring was at there at the outset, the protection of Hamas was there at the outset, the moral diffidence, which in a, in a position like this is immoral was there from the outset. So, I mean, I, I see the dissonance in his things, but when, when you, I guess we should, we should uh, start thinking about ending this. So I guess the last question that I really want to ask you is if you had the year of prime minister Netanyahu and he's facing also this countervailing, very powerful uh, 
pressures, that the Israeli people are almost entirely unified in an unbelievable determination to simply get the job done. And the more footage that leaks out, because they're reasonably trying to hide it from us because it's it's so terrible. Um, but the, everybody who sees something, you know, the immediate response is, and, and it's not visceral, it's both visceral and rational. We cannot live with these people. They must be destroyed. They must be annihilated. We These are monsters. These there are monsters in human form, and they're eating us. And, and we can't have them here. And you have this unanimity of opinion on the public, among the public. And on the other hand, you have this unanimity of pressure and hostility internationally. Even Sisi is bowing to public opinion in, in Egypt, apparently. He's, I mean, we helped him defeat uh, ISIS, and he's threatening to go to war with us if we push the Gazans out of, of Gaza so that we can fight the war to, to, to victory. So, you know, we're, it, it, Bibi's looking at this. The Americans are putting on pressure for us to collapse, to make a deal with Qatar to get the hostages out. And who knows what the payoff would be? It could be that it's complete strategic collapse. That's what we're hearing now in the news. More and more uh, rumor mills stirring that uh, Qatar is behind this hostage release. And it's, he, he's in a bind. You know, he was caught with his pants down. It was on his watch that the single worst day of slaughter of the Jewish people since the Holocaust occurred. What What do you say to him? I say to him, as an American, that we are not naive, and we know that we are the only state that understands Israel's dilemma, not Europe, not anybody else. So it's very important for us to support you. And we have elements in our state that are not fully committed to Israel. And that's frustrating for him, and that puts him in a terrible bind because we have to supply needed munitions. That said, forget all of the conundrum, all of the news accounts. The fact is human nature is human nature. If Israel does not respond to the worst day since the Holocaust, all of the people who are telling him not to respond will privately say Israel is weak. You see, Hamas must have been right anyway, because what more could they do to Israel to inflame them, and yet they did not respond? So counterintuitively, it is, if Israel responds, and it's a, it's a very considerable challenge, it'll take all of the talent and energy of the idea, but if they can respond, and I think most of us think they can and will succeed, that will be a deterrent, and that strength to protect the Jewish people will resonate throughout the world. They may not want to publicly admit it. You will get people coming all over from the Arab world privately applauding you. You will get people who say, this is the Israel I remember. If Israel does not do that, and they give in to pressure, you will have a theater-wide war with Hezbollah and Iran, because they will say, this is a postmodern Jewish population, and it gives in to a postmodern decadent America, and they're not going to respond to us, because why would they if they didn't respond fully after what we did to them with Hamas? And so it's very hard for people to accept that message that a short-term, gruesome experience as it's going to be is absolutely necessary for peace and to stop Hezbollah and Iran. And when you make that argument, carefully to Americans, I think they understand. If Israel goes in, I think they have to. I don't know any other way to, without doing it. to get. They have to destroy Hamas. And if they don't, and they listen to our government, they're in big trouble. And I say that as an American with great reluctance. But uh, I hope that when they go on, the American people will rally to them. And the more successful they are, the people in Europe, and in the Arab world. And that's a very, that's an indictment of their morality, that they only judge their support on Israel by its efficacy or usefulness to them. But they are terrified of Hamas and what it represents in Europe and the Middle East, and yet they will be your biggest critics if you don't do anything, and they will be your biggest critics as you do it. But if you're successful, they will cease their criticism. And that's, it's hard to take, but that's the truth. Oh, I agree. I, I I couldn't I couldn't agree more. And um, 
and and I really you know I I, I would I would want to uh, keep you for another you know hour. I have an, at least another hour worth of questions, but I I I will. Are there any other things that you think are important to uh, say that I that I didn't ask you about? Well, I, I think a lot of people in Israel feel they're alone now and people don't understand. They look at, they say to themselves, you know, you tell the Ukrainians to be disproportionate. You tell the Ukrainians we're going to give you all you need. You tell the Ukrainians they can, they can have martial law, they can suspend elections, they'd have to do whatever they want. You don't tell the Ukrainians when you hit a bridge, be sure to call and make sure there's not Russian. It's so, what's going on in the world? We understand that. But that's been the history of the Jewish people. And any time they have had confidence and acted resolutely, resolutely and morally, they win support. And most of the people in the United States are behind them and will support them. And uh, we don't want to tell Israel as Americans, we want you to go into Gaza because that's going to be you're going to pay a price for that. And people who are safe should not tell people who are on the edge. But all we can say is, if you decide to go into Gaza geostrategically, I think it will be in your interest successfully. And we, each according to our station in the United States, are going to try to support you. That's all we can do. And we hope you win. And we hope well, you win every day. That. Yes. Just... I think that's what we're going to well, have to do. Thank you very much, Victor, for yes. that. Well, we are dealing with pre-modern people that we haven't seen what they did. Well, I, I have never seen it. I didn't even see it with the, the accounts with the Hutus and the Tutsis. It's something that's pre-civilizational, and that has to be stopped. And it doesn't just have to be stopped. It has to be sent a message. If you ever try that again, it's equivalent to your extinction. And I think that's the only way it's going to stop. I don't know. I think that they've they've earned their their extinction today. I I don't see any reason why we have to give them another chance to figure. No, that I don't one mean out. you have to give them another chance. You have to give them no chance, but you have to send <laughs> a message that if anybody would like to follow that example, then the the remedy for it is now evident and assured. Thank you very much, Carolyn. Thank you, Victor. Thank you for joining me, and thank you for your for for your support for Israel. Appreciate it. Okay. And we'll see you again soon, I hope. Thanks so okay. much, and in better circumstances. I All hope right. so. I think so, too. Take care. Bye-bye.